I'm David Frankel, an archaeologist. I'd like to talk to you today about Orangery Ceremonial Ground. So, with the permission of the elders of the Orangery Wairung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them and also to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and, of course, the heritage that we will be discussing and to pay my respects to the elders, both of the present and of the past, whose lives and activity is the focus of our interest today. One of the significant elders of the recent past, who lived a little over a hundred years ago, was William Barrack. And among other things, he painted pictures of ceremonies and related activities. Were always important in traditional Aboriginal society both here in Victoria and elsewhere across the continent. People would travel long distances from their home country to the related areas with, with peoples with whom they shared ceremonies and related activities. Messengers would go out, as described here by Alfred Howitt, reporting what his major informant, William Barrack, had told him about in this case, how the Woiwurrung was the headman of some locality who sent out messages to collect people for festive occasions, for set fights, for other matters concerning the tribe. And he did this after consulting with the old men. And these messages would often carry particularly message sticks carved in well understood designs and patterns. We'll be looking primarily at areas just to the north. Our focus is on Sunbury, about 40 kilometres from the centre of the city. And here, in the grounds of the Salesian College on the outskirts of Sunbury, we have the hill slopes overlooking Jackson's Creek. And if we zoom on level, we see a shallow circular ring, a shallow dish carved out of the hill slope. It's hard to see, but you can see the curve of an embankment around from the left around to the foreground and in the centre a scatter of stones near the ranging pole and the small child. I was first shown these sites in 1978 by colleagues from the Victoria Archaeological Survey. It was unclear whether these were Aboriginal and if they were how they were used although somewhat similar sites are known elsewhere in Australia. Our first task was to document them and then to explore the greater details of their shape and structure and perhaps ascertain their meaning. Our first task was then to document sites and surface surveys. And here we plotted the nature of the sites. You can see in the upper left a contour plan. It looks a little unusual, but it's because the ground itself is sloping. The wireframe projection below is a little bit exaggerated than vertical, but it gives us a way of seeing the shape more clearly than we could in other ways. After having surveyed and documented, we then undertook some excavations. You can see here the layout of the squares we laid across the site, including where that scatter of stones was, and up across the embankment. A second set of excavations down to the south, where there was another scatter of stones. Those stones on excavation proved to be a consolidated cairn of stones, carefully constructed. You see the central cairn here in the photograph, but also get an idea of how shallow the deposits were. A thin layer of soil above the harder bedrock. We also excavated across the embankment the section drawing below shows the sequence of deposits as we saw them. It's a little bit hard to understand just looking at that picture. So let's see this. Initially, perhaps, Aboriginal people came to this area. There was bedrock and above it, just below that green line, there were surface deposits, looser soil, scatters of organic material and so on. Away digging a little bit into the bedrock and heap the soil up around to form an embankment enclosing the circle. Later, after it had fallen out of use, 
That embankment eroded, flattened out, the ring filled in, and we have the feature as we see it today. This matches a description, the construction of such a ring. This was written by Robin Matthews in 1905, but he was reporting what Aboriginal people had explained to him some decades earlier. These Aboriginal people from related communities to those who lived around Sunbury. They, they were from up the Campaspe and the Loddon Rivers. And they talked about how when they needed to have a ceremony of a particular sort, a fairly level patch of ground was cleared of all rubbish and loose sticks, which were collected into heaps and burnt off. The grass was then chipped off and the surface made smooth, the space enclosed by a circular bank of loose earth, about six inches to a foot high, called a goanga. And then various activities took place in and around this meeting ground while waiting for people to congregate for the larger ceremonies. In our excavation, we also found a number of small, sharp silkrete blades. Silkrete is a fine grained stone often used for making chipstone artifacts. It's very sharp when first flaked. Here we can see within the squares. Some of them are lighter shading, that's where we found just a few um, flakes. And the two darker squares are where there was, in each, there were more than 40 flakes. That was the centre of activity, at least as we can see it in our excavation. The little red dots are where there were cores, the stone from which these sharp flakes were struck. Again, the concentration is to the cairn in the centre, obviously a focal point of some activities. What were these stones for? Well, one possibility is they relate to a custom in this part of Australia where men and women were ornamented with cicatrices. This is as described by James Dawson, who was most familiar with Aboriginal people in the areas around Camperdown, but the same would apply in Sunbury. Men and women were ornamented with cicatrices, scars made when they came of age, on the chest, back, upper parts of the arms. And these cicatrices were darker hue than the skin, varying in length from half an inch to an inch. Arranged in lines and figures according to the tastes and customs of the tribe, the operator cuts through the skin with a flint knife and rubs the wound with green grass. So our little chips, our flakes, our blades of silkrete were perhaps used for this purpose, part of ceremonies taking place within the ring. There are three rings near to one another. The one we've just looked at is between two others. One of them is a little bit different in form. As you can see, shows up most clearly in the black and white aerial photograph, but also in our wireframe projection. It appears to be a double ring. This may be because it's deliberately constructed with a different form, but it's perhaps more likely that people had returned to the same spot and some subsequent occasions reworked and reformed the ring. And what we're seeing here is the product of several visits, or at least two visits to the site and remaking a ring for ceremonies at the same spot. It may have been 10 years, 20 years, a generation or two later, but a continued use of the same area. There are other rings not far away. As you leave Sunbury, traveling north on Riddles Creek Road, you can look out to the hill slopes across the way, and there is another ring, often visible, depending on the weather conditions and how the grass has grown. And the, the western side of Sunbury and what is now Fullwood Drive, another ring shows up very clearly, as you can see in these two photographs. An important aspect, as we've already noted, is to do with the connections of people as they came together for ceremonies, part of traditions linking different groups with one another. We can see this both through reports and understandings, so reports by Europeans observing Aboriginal people within Aboriginal traditions and understandings through archaeology. The best example of this is through hatchet heads particular stone was highly prized for making hatchet or axe heads and particular quarries served as the sources for the stone, much sought after by people. 
was undertaken by Professor Isabel McBride, who was able to identify the sources and link them to different quarries, and then to trace the distribution of stones that had been found in the surface and fields across large areas. Of particular is the distribution of Mount William stone, a quarry not that far from Sunbury. As you can see in that red line indicating the extent of its distribution, stone from Mount William found its way either people carrying it directly or a series of exchanges across all of central and western Victoria, up north into New South Wales and across westward into South Australia. An indication of the distances of connections and links and chains of connection interact where Aboriginal people were interacting with one another in different Often those exchanges took place at large gatherings held for ceremonies, perhaps initiation ceremonies, as we suggested for the sundry circles. But when you bring forward a lot of people together for quite long periods of time, a week or two perhaps, to make sure everybody could arrive and the ceremonies could take place over several days, you need to be able to feed them. Now it happens that we have a description of one major resource, the Milnong or Yam Daisy. And here, in about 1909, 1910, Isaac Beatty wrote his reminiscences and he remembered things of many decades earlier when he was a young man in the area around Sunbury. There he'd noted that the soil on the spot is a rich basaltic clay, evidently well fitted for the production of Milnongs. On the spot adverted to were numerous mounds with short spaces between each, as all of these at right angles to the ridge's slope, it's conclusive evidence they were the work of human hands extending over a long series of years. Well, what are Munong or the Yam Daisy? It was a major Victorian Aboriginal people, although now it is rare because the soils were hardened, transformed with European animals and farming practices. But as described by James Dawson, it was a, somewhat resembles a small parsnip with a flower like a buttercup, grown chiefly on the open plains, much esteemed on account of its sweetness, and dug up by women with a minnong pole. The roots are washed and put in a rush basket, made on purpose and placed in the oven in the evening to be ready for next morning's breakfast. When several families live near each other and cook their roots together, sometimes the baskets form a pile three feet high. So we can imagine large numbers of women going out to the fields near Sunbury, collecting mirnong, which provided the staple food while the ceremonies were being held. Let's return to the sites in Fullwood Drive. This is how they looked when we first saw them some 40 years ago. But what happened next? In 1990, we see the sites in the open fields they show very clearly it's an open expanse within the circle. We can imagine the activities taking place, but also people camping in the areas all around and other related activities taking place. By 1999, the area has been scheduled for development. Sunbury is a growth area, much expansion of housing in the last 30 years. Fences are being built around the site. It's preserved because we could identify it on the basis of the research we'd done earlier, and we could say that this was definitely an Aboriginal site of significance. By 2008, houses being constructed all around. Now the site sits in a small area surrounded on three sides by housing. It has lost that general environmental context. We see it as an isolated feature, removed time, place and significance from what it was originally. So although preserved, it gives no feeling for what went on there or its significance or how it functioned. If we go back to the Riddles Creek Road, we look across the hill slope, we can see that ring showing up as we saw before very clearly. These areas too are scheduled for development nearby. So what happens now? How can we preserve and protect these particular rings 
so that they retain something of the overall context, not just seen as some remote, lost little feature surrounded by modern housing. It's a challenge, a challenge to be met by a combination of archaeologists, heritage advisors, and the Aboriginal community, together with town planners and developers. I've given you my own personal archaeological, academic archaeological perspective on these sites and their significance and how they worked. For traditional owner perspectives, it would be best to talk to the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation and get an understanding from them as they see the importance of these sites within their heritage. For those who want to look more closely at both the archaeology and the quotations that I've used, here is a list of books and articles that I've extracted information from. But for further information, you could contact the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung uh, Cultural Heritage Corporation and also the Heritage Services Branch of Aboriginal Victoria. This talk of some interest. Thank you for listening.